All right, I am Adrian Manns, and today I'm going to talk about uh, some technical strategies that I use, that we use, my wife Julie and I, to trade the markets each and every day. So we have been professional traders since 1997, I guess, and we've got sort of a unique history because we go back uh, to just sort of when online trading was starting and we were researchers at the time. So we were graduate students working on our MBAs and PhDs and we had the opportunity to dig into some data and figure out how things work and sort of positioned ourselves back then as order flow traders. We were trying to get on the same side of the market as the specialists on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. That's where we were getting a lot of our data from. That's where we had the opportunity to sort of get an inside view on how the markets work. So ever since then, we've been trading these same strategies. We have not really changed anything that we're doing over the years. We follow market cycles. We follow a set of patterns through the market. They just sort of give us the footprints of what's happening with the money as the markets are trading. And over the years, what that's done for us is given us an edge. And the edge comes in the form of we have the courage of our convictions. We don't wind up second guessing a lot of what we're doing. And we just sort of know what we're going to do before we do it. And we get in there and 90% of what we're doing every single day is carrying out some pre-planned trades, things that we set up the night before. We know exactly what we're going to do before it's time to do it. And that has made for a wonderful career and a really hassle-free, argument-free marriage working with, uh, working with your spouse in this business that can really be pretty tough. We are the co-founders of TraderInsight.com. We started that in roughly 1999 as just a way of providing some trader education and trader training. We do quite a bit of trader training at this point. We do about four live events a year. Two of them are boot camps. Two of them are some other intensive kind of trainings that I'll tell you about in a little bit. And in 2023, you'll see us as the hosts of Trader Nation. So Trader Nation is out for syndication right now. This is going to be a show that's all about trading and trader psychology and how it is that you can go and gain an edge in the markets and focus your attention exactly where it needs to be focused, namely on working with the market rather than trying to beat it. So a big part of what we've done over the years is sharing what we do with other people. And we've written lots and lots of articles for uh, trade magazines and for journals and been featured in a bunch of books. I've also written uh, some books myself and I've got a new copy of that one up in the left corner coming out um, probably sometime late in 2023. That's Around the Horn, a trader's guide that's consistently scoring in the markets. That book's written around a baseball metaphor because what I found in all the statistical analyses and everything that we were doing was that of all the things in the world that you could compare trading to, if you're going to use a sports analogy, which is what my publisher wanted me to do, baseball was a really good place to start. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that trading can be as much about the psychology of stepping up to the plate as it can about the mechanics of, of knowing exactly what a pattern looks like, of knowing how to how to go and execute a trade, how to get into a position, out of a position, place stop losses, place profit targets, all that kind of stuff. What trading professionally and teaching trading over the last 25, 26 years has really taught me more than anything else is there's a lot of forces that are pulling on a trader's brain. So with that in mind, the income trading boot camp that we do is one of my favorite things to do. And if you take a look at these pictures, look around there, what you see is there's a bunch of people who they've all got very different psychologies. They come from different places in life. And as you go around the room, you've got everything from a cop to a farmer to a lawyer to a doctor. And my job when I'm working with these guys, I forgot to say engineers, there's always a lot of engineers. My job when I'm working with them is I need to get them in a room. Once they're there together, I need to teach them what it is that we do when we trade and how we are able to navigate the markets. 
And then I need to help them navigate their own psychology because every one of these guys is very different. Everybody who goes to boot camp has their own preconceptions about what trading is, about how it's going to fit into their psychology, about what it is that's going to make it a, a good fit or a bad fit for them and how they're going to go out and overcome this thing that's really hard for a lot of people to do. And I think that as you're watching today's presentation and I'm talking about what it is that I do and you're trying to figure out if that fits into your repertoire, if you can add that to what, what you do every day, the important thing for you to think is not, can I make money with this? It's, does this fit me psychologically? Can I make this part of what I do? Can I make this part of me? Because for all these guys, the key to success has been they've got to embrace it. They have to take it and they have to make it their own so that when they get up in the morning, they walk into their trading office or their trading room with the courage of their convictions. and They're not afraid of the day that's ahead of them. And once they've got that down, the mechanics, the tricks of the trade, so to speak, that's all going to come much easier than it is if you're trying to pound a square peg into a round hole. So all of that is to say the psychological stuff is very, very important. Now, obviously, Julie and I are both psychologists, and we've managed to keep ourselves centered and focused. And we spend a lot of time talking to our guys. Our boot camp alumni will we'll spend as much time talking to us about the psychology of trading as they do about the strategies and techniques that they're trying to get a grip on. And that's just because if you don't really understand yourself and you are trying this exercise of pounding the square peg into a round hole, you can fall into a lot of traps that will just sink your entire trading business. So as we move forward and we start talking about the technical stuff, I know that's what everybody wants to get to. I really want to encourage everybody to focus first on your own psychology. And just think about how has psychology affected your trading over time? Has it been helpful? Has it been detrimental? Has your psychology got the best of you? Have you managed to conquer your demons? Because people ask me things about, you know, like, what's your war room like? Or, you know, I see you've got all these monitors and all this stuff in your war room. And I tell them, whoa, 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 you know, your war room is between your ears. And before a monitor or a computer or anything else is going to do you any good at all, you have to get a grip on how you're wired, what's your relationship with money, how did you grow up, right? Do you know the value of a buck? Do you categorize yourself as being cheap? Do you categorize yourself as being a spendy person? Do you, do you see yourself as getting a lot of worth out of your, your money? Do you see yourself as having more self-worth based on the skills that you have? All of these things can combine to affect the way that you go about placing your trades and managing your trading business. So just think for a second about your career as a trader and ask yourself if any of this stuff sounds familiar, because these are quite frankly the things that we see most often when we're working with people. There's people who fail to pull the trigger on a good setup. Why do they fail to pull the trigger? Because they think that maybe something is a little bit different this time than it was the last time. They think that the market got the better of them the last go around. And, you know, this time they're, they're not going to get suckered in again. They think that maybe the market is about to make a turn. They start analyzing things and they look for information that's going to go and counter what they've been planning to do. So this person is almost always looking to self-sabotage. And what winds up happening then is once they fail to pull the trigger on that good setup, they watch it go without them. And then when the next setup comes along, and maybe it's not such a good one, they wind up taking it because they want to get revenge. Right? So the revenge trading and revenge trading is one of the worst things that you can do because now the logic for why you were getting into something in the first place is out the window. And now you're going and you're grabbing something just because, you know what, I didn't get it the last time. I'm going to get it this time. Then there's people who let losing trades run. I can't tell you how many times I have these conversations with people who aren't using stops or who are moving their stops, actively moving their stops to avoid taking a loss. That emanates from it feels bad to lose. Everybody here knows that it's not a great feeling to lose, especially not to lose money. And once they start ratcheting against these positions, 
they start widening stops or they stop taking stops altogether. I've had people say to me, I don't put stops on those triple Q trades because over the course of the day, they always come back to at least where they opened. And my response is, what are you going to do on the day that that doesn't happen? You're going to wind up underwater. And then it's a question of how long can you stay underwater if your conviction is that it is definitely going to come back eventually. What happens when your margin goes from four to one to two to one at the closing bell? What happens when you get a margin call the next morning? Does that affect your psychology and your ability to take the next trade? Letting losing trades run is all about not having that bad emotion. It's about deferring the bad emotion, and it is a surefire way to wind up in the poorhouse. The other side of that coin is people will cut winning trades short, and you should be very quick to reason here that the reason that somebody would cut a trade short when it's on a, on a winning streak is because what they want to do is get that emotion of winning. So I've got one guy, John, who you know does not mind me calling him out, but John C. will get in there in the morning and fire off two or 300 trades. And they're all in the same direction. And what he's doing is he keeps taking 10 or 15 cents of profits because it feels good to take the money off the table. That's his, his word for it. So he's got sort of a gambling mentality and he likes to take these wins. But he's also letting losers run when they go against him because he doesn't want to realize the loss. He says, well, if I go ahead and I close that trade out, then I've realized the loss. And you know, then I have to suffer the consequences of I lost money today as opposed to I can just go and take a bunch of little wins every time the thing ticks in my favor. I'm going to take some money out of it, and that feels great. These are traits that a lot of traders experience, and we've got some psychological tests that you can take for free at TraderInsight.com if, if you'd like to email us and tell us you want to take those and get a little bit of insight into who it is that you are or what your demons are, maybe that you aren't aware of. Those are very useful tools to look at. Other people add to a losing position. So when you take a position that's down and you start doubling down on it, a lot of people have this attitude of, well, that's dollar cost averaging and that's just the way that I was taught to invest. And quite frankly, it's not a great way to manage a trading business. So in the, in the business itself, I can tell you, when people have a bunch of their losing trades doubled up and tripled up, the insiders will call those portfolios because what you've done is taken something that wasn't working and compounded it and then compounded the impact of how much it isn't working by adding to it. Morning profits and afternoon losses. Do you find yourself feeling like you're playing with house money? So you make money in the morning and then you go and you get riskier and riskier positions that you're putting on over the course of the afternoon, or you keep trading in the afternoon, even though you don't have a strategy for trading in the afternoon. There's all sorts of rationale for why people have big opening profits in the morning and then wind up with losses in the afternoon and then wind up having to dig out of a, a hole going into the closing bell. If that's something that you see yourself doing, this is something in your psychology that you have to address. Taking unplanned trades. Here's another one. This is something I'm going to talk about extensively here over the next half hour or so. The trades that I'm taking are all planned. They look like discretionary trades. These are technical trades that are put together with the benefit of having a trading plan. We're trading them by the numbers. We know what we're going to do before we're going to do it. And that prevents us then from sitting there with our hands on our head later saying, why in the heck did I do that? We know exactly why we're doing everything. We can go through and give a very rational explanation for everything that we've done over the course of the day. And that puts us in a position to succeed. Holding trades for a home run. Here's another one. I tell people all the time, and you're going to see it in one of the examples that I provide a little bit later, where a stock actually goes $2 in my favor after I've exited the position. And I just tell people all the time, the chances of getting a home run on an intraday trade are practically zero. The place that you chose as a profit objective, if you chose it correctly, is the likely inflection that's going to halt the trade and reverse it. 
So all these times that you find yourself saying, well, I'm going to trail the stop and I'm going to trail the stop 30 cents or I'm going to trail it 10 cents. First off, trailing at 10 cents is just a guarantee you're going to get stopped out. Trailing at 40 cents is practically a guarantee that you're going to wind up 40 cents from your profit objective rather than at your profit target. The best thing to do, the best practice to be in is to set it up and forget it. Set it and move to the next trade. Don't try to second guess your thinking once you're in. You set the profit objective for a reason. Stick to the reasoning. And then we have people who reduce their position size after a loss. And I can't tell you how often I see this one happen as well. People that lose money on a trade, so they reason that what they should do now is reduce their position size. I'm going to drop it down to 100 shares because I got my head handed to me and I need to figure out what's going on here. And they drop it down to 100 shares and what they don't realize is that's changed the psychology of the trade. So now they get it down to 100 shares or 200 shares or whatever is a fraction of what they were trading. And what they find themselves doing is trading it perfectly. Well, geez, I made money the whole time I had it at 100 shares. Now, two things happen. They feel bad because they could have made their money back, which is, again, revenge trading. Revenge trading, just hiding in the weeds. And they wind up not taking into account the fact that this goes back to what is your relationship with money? Did you get profitable with 100 shares? Because that's where you're comfortable trading psychologically. That's where you're comfortable sticking to your discipline, and that's where you can make things work. Whereas when you're trading 1,000 shares, all you can think about is how much you stand to lose, so you're looking for every reason to violate what your rules were when you got into the position. So think about all that stuff as we go forward here and talk about these strategies. So let's take a look at something technical. That's why we're here, talk about technical trading. And... As I said, this is really about whether or not something fits your personality, fits your style. I think in order for something to be a good fit, you need to understand how it works. So there's not a black box. This is something that I do every day. This is a statistical process control, if you will, that I apply to the market, and I use that to trade opening gaps. So let me show you my statistical probability theory in action here i've been doing this for 25 26 years and i can tell you that it still works as well today as it did when we first started trading it. what we're going to do just as is the case with everything that we do in terms of volatility trading we're going to create a roadmap for how to do this particular setup and it's all about isolating the volatility determining our directional bias and limiting the amount of decision-making that we have to do on the fly. So that we take ourselves out of the equation as much as we possibly can and just allow the trade to take care of itself. I call this one Baltimore Chop. This is a two standard deviation opening gap reversion trade. I call it Baltimore Chop for a reason. I told you the book was written around the analogy of baseball. And I'll show you why here in a second that this reminds me of an old Baltimore Orioles trick Pitcher threw the ball, batter spiked it, popped it over the pitcher's head, and before the ball came back down to the ground, that slow runner managed to get to first. Why does this remind me of an opening gap? So let's take a look first at all the stuff that goes into this one, at, at the presumptions that we're making. First off, range and true range. We're going to use true range as a proxy for volatility. This is a volatility reversion trade. We used to do this by using the implied volatility of the front month options contract on every single security in the S&P 500. Then we figured out that range, or more specifically true range, was a very good proxy for the volatility that we were trying to measure. So you guys all know that the range today is just the high minus the low. You have a bar chart, you take the high value, subtract the low value. If the high here was 50.10 and the low was 49.40, the range was 70 cents on the day. What that doesn't include is gaps. And when you're measuring something statistically, you really want to have the thing that you're measuring be accounted for. When we use true range, it takes the gap into account. So it's either the greater value of the high minus the low 
or the absolute value of the high minus the previous close or the low minus the previous close. So what that does for you is it'll take today's high, subtract yesterday's closing price, and now what you've accounted for is any gap between those bars. So if the high price is $50.10 and the previous close was $49, then the true range is $1.10 for the day. Now you've accounted for the gap and you've got something that you can measure statistically. There's a lot of assumptions that go into statistics. First off, you have to assume that you have normally distributed data in order to be able to analyze it. I can tell you volatility data and true range data is normally distributed. You're also assuming true range is a proxy for volatility. We have found over the last 25 years that it most certainly is a proxy for volatility. And you're assuming that volatility is mean reverting. And what these three things give you then when you have all these assumptions in place is access to this bell-shaped curve. Bell-shaped curve is a normal probability distribution. Right in the middle here is your average. So you've all seen this, right? This is your average of a bunch of data. If you go out what we call one standard deviation, you've accounted for 68% of everything that you're expecting to see before you get a reversion to the mean. If you go out two standard deviations, you're at 95%. So you've got a 95% confidence interval around that mean that says you have a high likelihood of a mean reversion. It doesn't mean we're going to close a gap. It doesn't mean we're going to go all the way back to the average. What it means is you've got data with an average running right through the middle. That black line in the middle is the mean. You've got periods of high volatility where you're out two standard deviations and you have periods of mean reversion, these blue balloons here, where you're moving back towards the average volatility. And what this allows you to do then is take an opening gap and figure out if you have a 95% probability that you're going to move back toward that average volatility. The formula for this is very simple. You can do it in Microsoft Excel. You can do it in your trading software. A standard deviation is just the square root of each observation of X, which is each day's true range, minus the 10-day average of the true range. So you don't want to use ATR as your X input. You want to make sure that in your trading software you're generating true range, not average true range. But when you put it into this formula, you're going to subtract the average from each individual day. You square that. You divide it by N, which is 10, the number of days. We don't worry about degrees of freedom with this statistic. And then we take the square root to get rid of that square. And that gives us then one standard deviation. And it's a very simple calculation. So you see we've got the true range for days 1 through 10. And when we plug these into the formula and we subtract the average, which is then 1.25. So you just get that average by adding up all of those numbers of day 1 through 10, so dividing it by 10. And then you have 1.25 is your average true range that you're subtracting. N is 10, and when we take the formula and apply it, we get 49 cents is one standard deviation. So if we multiply that by 2, it's 98 cents. If we add 98 cents to that mean, to the dollar twenty-five, then we get $2.23, and in this case, that's how much the stock would have to gap in order for it to have a two standard deviation opening gap. So here we have, these are intraday bars, these are five minute bars, you see we're counting up into yesterday's close. It's going higher, going higher, going higher, and then it drops. And that gap, we're assuming here, is two standard deviations. And then all we're doing is following the price lower until we get to the lowest high. So we want to see that stair step move down. Looks like a pullback. Whatever you want to call this, as the highs are moving down, we keep saying if we get to a bar that puts in the lowest high that we see, then in the next five minute bar, we're going to enter the trade and we're going to fade back in the direction of something that happened in that first bar of trading. So in this case, a lot of times I'll look at the high or the close or the open or the low, right? Something that happened in the first bar of trading that tells me that's a likely place that we're going to see a repeat, that we're going to see price start to fall again, or in the case of a short trade, the price starts to rise there. But one way or another, I'm looking to fade that two standard deviation move back in the direction of the open.
So why'd I call it Baltimore Chop? To me, this looks a lot like that ball getting spiked down and popping up over the pitcher's head. So how do we go about finding the opportunities? If you text me for the videos, then what I'll do is I'll give you access for a couple weeks to this thing here, which is our scanner on TraderInsight.com, and you can come in and join us in our first hour trading pit. We have a strategy session in the morning where we go over these. What you see on the scanner, and this is from uh, Thursday, is data divided the way that Julie and I have always used it. So we have this thing programmed up, S&P 500s, S&P 400, and news, both long and short. And on the top, we have the long side of the market. On the bottom, we have the short side of the market. And what you see is that in this case, we had DFS. And DFS shows up as an S&P 500 trade. It shows up as being in the news. It's marked with an asterisk, which means it has earnings today. And that's key for me because I like to focus on stocks that are in the news because of earnings. So I don't want to have to go digging around to figure out whether the CFO is sitting in a jail cell somewhere or the CEO resigned and there's some big problem at the company. This is not game-changing news. This is run-of-the-mill earnings. And over the course of the session, in the morning, I go through and I mark these. I highlight them in yellow when I decide I'm going to take the trade so that all the guys know, hey, this is the one that Adrian's focusing on, or these are the ones. Usually there's more than just one on the list. We'll end up with, you know, this week is going to be earnings, so there's probably going to be 5, 10, 15 of them every day. And I go through and I sort them and I figure out which ones I like the best, which ones are most in the spirit of the setup. And then we take them from this platform here and we input them into our trading software. So you see here, this looks just like that example that I showed you. So Discover Financial opens, it's gapped down two standard deviations. We've got a high in bar one, a lower high in bar two. That's all we wind up with. So now what we're going to do is in bar three, we're planning to go long above the high of bar two, and we're targeting something in that first bar of trading. Somebody always asks, how did you know that that was going to be the lowest high? Well, you don't know. You're setting up for each bar as it comes in. You're just resetting your trade. So what I do is I use bracket orders, and then I can just pull the price down on the chart. So I've got a visual on my chart where I pulled it down. I'll show you how you set up a bracket order in a second here. But effectively, what the bracket order is telling the software to do is when we violate that high, I want to go long. And I want to get all the way up into the top of that bar. And I'm going to have a stop down below something significant that happened in one of these bars of trading. In this case, I can tell you it's that low of bar number one that corresponds to some volume by price out on the right side of the axis there. And all of those things add up to me to say, if it moves down below the low of bar one, I want to be out of the trade. And if it gets up above the high of bar two, I want to be long the position. And it's pretty simple to set up. So here you would just take a bracket order and you say if it gets above 95.57, which is a little bit higher than that second bar. It's not an exact science. You just want to sort of eyeball where the high of the bar is. Could you do 95.52? Of course. I like to give a little bit of room. 95.57 is my stop. 95.67 is my limit. So 95.57 is the activation price. That's where if it ticks there, 95.57, the order is going to go live and it's going to get me the worst case scenario is going to be a fill at 95.67. If I don't get filled by 95.67, it'll just pass on that trade. Then we see that if I get that worst case scenario, 95.67 fill, and my exit is $97.50, if I was trading 1,000 shares, I'd have an $1,830 profit. And if I'm putting the stop loss down at 94.85, down below this low and down below this volume by price threshold over here, if I were to go and have an adverse move, I'd be down 820 bucks on the trade. So that's a reward to risk ratio that works for me. And if that $820 was something that gave me psychological discomfort, then what I would do is reduce the share size. I wouldn't change the stop. Once we're in the trade, we'll start ratcheting the stop up. You try to get this thing risk-free as fast as possible. But the initial stop is going to be $94.85. And as I said, if that's a number that I'm not comfortable with at $820, I can just take this thing down to 100 shares if I want. And then I've got $82 worth of risk and $183 worth of potential profitability. 
that's where you make the adjustments. The market does not care in any way, shape, or form how much you'd like to make or what you're willing to lose. You've got to do these things based on logic, and you have to do these things based on this is where the thresholds are that are very likely going to make or break for a stock. And I don't care that price went on and shot up to the moon, went up to $101.90. If, if that was where I wound up on the day, well, good for me. But in my case, what I'm looking to do is capitalize on the move that's right in front of me, capitalize on the thing that has the highest statistical probability, and that's a move back up into the high of that first bar. Okay, so that is the statistical trade that I do. That's like a very by-the-numbers kind of a trade. So let's talk about something that a lot of people are drawn to, which is discretionary trading. And in this case, it's discretionary order flow trading. This is not representative of the lion's share of what I do in my trading business. Julie and I are focused on pre-planned trades. We set them up to go off automatically. We've got lots of things that are going on in the background. We have a lot of orders that have been set up ahead of time, conditional orders, things that go through and use algorithms to check and see are particular conditions present in the stock that we're looking at. And then if yes, if the answer is yes, it goes and it executes according to my trading plan. So that's that's one part of our business. This is another part, and this is something that, like I said, people are really drawn to. This is sort of the sexy side of trading, right? This is where you can show people what you can do, what you're good at, that you're able to do something that a lot of people obviously cannot do because it's hard to get a read on the market. I'm going to tell you that it is doable and that's particularly true if you take the time to put the odds in your favor. So you have to line these trades up so that they're a lot less discretionary usually than you'd like them to be. I want to go through. I want to plan things. I want to have logical reasons for doing everything that I'm going to do. And this list right here tells you pretty much what the reasoning is or what the logic is behind this whole thing. So I start with the big picture. And in the case of these discretionary trades, these order flow types of trades, I'm usually looking at the spiders, diamonds, cues. I personally trade a lot of cues. We also look at Apple, Netflix, Nvidia, Microsoft, sometimes Tesla. Those are all stocks that we'll have on these lists that we work with over the course of the day. But the process is always the same. So I start with the big picture. I'm going to trade these things intraday, but I'm going to go out to the bigger time frame. I'm going to look at dailies usually, dailies, weeklies, monthlies even in some cases. And what I'm going to try to do is see what's the stock doing or what's the ETF or the future or whatever doing in sort of the bigger time frame. And I want to get from that my bias going into today's trading session. So we're going to look at how I set these up in a second here, but just sort of try to wrap your head around these seven points. Once I've determined my bias... I'm looking at either a long side bias, a short side bias. Now I can go in and I at least know what my expectancy is. I'm not just going to fire off trades based on, oh, it's going up or it's going down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be placing my trades very methodically based on what's happening in the bigger picture. What I'm going to do on the five-minute chart is I'm going to look for institutional footprints. So a lot of the ETF stuff that I do, a lot of the, the trading of the spiders, the diamonds, and cues, I wait those first couple hours out. I don't even take a trade in those. I've got plenty going on right around the market open. What I'm going to do with regards to these particular trades is I'm going to let the market settle in. So I want to see what happens over the first probably hour, two hours of the trading session. Normally right around 11.30 a.m. Eastern time, 8.30 a.m. our time. I'm putting together a video for the guys who are on these trading services with us, who are trading these things with us, and I'm saying, okay, this is what I'm looking at. Here's where I see the institutional activity early in the session. Here's what it looks like to me right now based on what's been going on on a five-minute chart. I think these are the levels that we're going to see some inflections at. And then I'm adding to that, not only did I see that there was natural price support and resistance there, but that other things are lining up. So I'm going to use indicators on my chart that are forward-looking indicators. So generally speaking, I know a lot of people like to use stochastics, a lot of people like to use MACDs and all that kind of stuff. Just bear in mind, when you're looking at these things, uh, you know, say a stochastic and you've got a 14-period or a 15-period stochastic or whatever it is that you're using, 
what those oscillators are really telling you is where is the close of the current bar relative to the close of the last 14 bars, last 15 bars, you know, however you've set the uh, parameter up. It's not really an overbought, oversold indicator. That's how a lot of people use it. It was not intended to be used that way. It's a nice thing to have on a chart so that you can just sort of glance at the chart and, and get a quick look at what's happening. But the reality is when you're using indicators, things like anchored VWAPs, the session VWAP, FIB projections, natural support and resistance, and other indicators of where order flow is likely to come into the market and push price in one direction or other, those are going to be a lot more valuable than something that's telling you what's been happening over the last 14 or 15 bars on a chart. Because you can always just go and look at the chart and you should be able to see what's happening there just by looking at it. But I know people like them and I know that they're at least useful in giving context sometimes to what's going on. So that's why I also do include those when you when you look at the nightly videos or the intraday videos, the 11.30 a.m. video that everybody gets. You'll see I've got those things on there, but it's just a quickie way to look back and see what's happening in the market. I always want to enter at one of those confluence levels. So wherever I've got a trend following idea set up, right? I'm going to go short. I'm going to go long based on what today's trend is. I'm going to use those confluence levels that I found as a backup for that. That's going to tell me, look, everything here is lined up. There's support and resistance. There's a FIB level. There's a VWAP. There's volume by price. Everything here tells me that the most likely thing that's going to happen is price is going to hit this level, and then it's going to go and do what it's been doing. We're going to get a resumption of a trend. So I'm always waiting for something to happen. I'm not hunting. I'm trapping. I'm setting a trap at a level, and I'm waiting for the price to get me and the price action is going to get me into the trade and then we're going to exit at the next inflection level i'm going to show you all this on a chart here in a second we're going to exit at a logical inflection level where is it that we're going to expect price to get a little bounce when we hit that level we want to get out we want to get out right in front of you we want to get out before the bounce happens and in terms of setting up stop losses what we're going to do is just the inverse we're going to look at where is the opposite inflection price is moving away from where we want it to go and when price gets to this point, it's either going to come back in our direction or based on how elastic that level is elastic. I just mean how much has price poked through that level in the past when we're determining that something's a support and resistance line based on those previous attempts at inflections, how spongy or how elastic is that price level? And if we get beyond the last level of elasticity there, then that's going to be the stop loss. So this is how I sort of set this stuff up in my head every day. I make sure, this is very second nature to me, right? But I make sure that I'm just going through all these different steps here so that I know that I have got the forces of the market working with me rather than against me. So let me just go to a chart here and I'll show you what I mean. Here we've got the QQQ on a daily chart. So this is the software that I use to place my trades. This is Realtek or as the EMS now execution management system now is owned by a, a company called as or SCNC actually bought them. And this is the platform that I use to do analysis and place my trades. You can see here, I just like a nice clean chart. So when I'm looking at the daily chart, the first thing that enters my stream of consciousness is this. We see here a market that is under tremendous pressure. We've got sideways price action recently, but pretty much for the most part, what we see is the ease of motion on this is going to be down. In this bigger picture, there's a couple of things that are going to pop out once we start looking at what's really happening in terms of market dynamics. So price has settled in over the past trading session right here at about this 277 75 77 level and the first thing that i see when i look at this is there's a bunch of things here telling me that price is likely going to move lower so if you're looking at this a bunch of stuff should pop out for you first and foremost we have lots of areas on this chart that tried to form a base right here and then collapsed and fell lower so we've got lots of attempts here to move higher but in general when the market comes back in here the ease of motion has always been to the downside the next thing you should see here is that this move lower 
should just be able to eyeball this kind of a thing, is a really solid fib retracement up into the 50 and the 618 in this daily time compression. So right now, if I'm going to bias myself for the following trading session, what I see is the ease of motion is probably going to be back down into right around this 382 level. And that would indicate that over the next few sessions, you've got the possibility at least of a move down about $4 from, from where the low of this current bar is. But I'm only looking at what's going to happen in tomorrow's trading. So the places that I'm going to be most interested in are going to be right in here where you see these opens and closes, highs and lows, and this big volume by price note over here. So that's still about $3 worth of range. And that says we've got at least a good opportunity to get in front of some downward momentum. Now, here's what I'm looking at. As I said, about 1130 in the morning, Eastern time, I'm going through and I'm going to start to try to figure out what has happened today in the market. And we see here that in the triple Qs, we've got some areas that we can spot some really pretty persistent selling. And we see that we got down into some areas that represent some pretty significant volume by price thresholds. So this stuff out over here is an algorithm that sort of weights the importance of what's going on at different levels, gives you a way of anticipating where the order flow is going to be. And it gives you an indication of what's going to happen as the day goes on. So this one I'm obviously doing over the weekend because we're on a ski trip and uh, I'm not going to be here to do this thing live. This is a recording for you folks, but this shows you the logic. And if you'd like to see the one from today, then you can just go ahead and shoot us a text. I'll give you that number later and you can be on the distribution list each day and receive these videos for a couple of weeks and see if they help you figure out how to trade these things and if maybe you're interested in working with us. But the first thing that I'm doing as I look at this is I'm trying to figure out where are things overlapping? Where are things happening during the day on this day that we already anticipate was going to have downside momentum? Now, we picked up a good chunk of what we would expect to be the range of motion for this thing from that opening bell down to where we are right now on this chart. But you want to take and pick apart all these areas that have represented significant price action over the course of the session. So I'm just going peak to trough of all the individual moves and trying to figure out where might I see some inflections going on as the day goes on. Once again, peak to trough. Now I'm going to do a fib retracement. And what we're starting to see is there's things that are overlapping. And I don't want to leave all this stuff on the chart because I don't want the chart all cluttered up. But as I look at this, what I see is I've got a fairly decent shot here at a move back down into this 278.98 level, probably from up around this 279.61 level. And that over the course of the day, there's a bunch of places that could represent logical inflections based on what's happened so far. But this is going to be an evolving story. So now you bump this thing forward a little bit, and what you see is that we had the tests of the area that we were expecting to see an inflection. So right up in here, those occurred right at the confluence of this pivot line. We had this VWAP very close by, this volume by price threshold, and of course this natural support and resistance line. So all that stuff added up to tell us that if we had the opportunity to take a short here, which we did, then we would get short on this violation of the line that we drew there, of the support and resistance line that we drew. We just eyeballed that. We're looking at where the most likely inflections were going to be. It overlaps nicely, as I said, with this volume by price data out here. And what do we do? So we get short, and we have a very good place to put a stop. The stop is based on that anchored VWAP. If it gets up above this orange line, then we definitely see there was a lot of elasticity up here. And if we get up into this top, it's very, very likely we're going to run up and through and probably retest this pivot. And that's not a trade we want to be on the wrong side of as that test is happening, because a bunch of stuff can just go wrong there and keep going wrong. No problem. If you're wrong, just don't stay wrong. 279.62, that first short sale entry. And that gets you down then to 278.97 for the target. 
And what happens after that, of course, is not our concern because we're putting these orders in as brackets. We want to set them and let them come to us. I don't want to interject my opinion or my bias as this is going on because my logical thinking is not going to be working for me as I get down into here. This is going to be a fear and greed kind of a situation, and I would say that's it for most people. As it's coming down to this level, you're thinking, oh my gosh, am I going to get a big extension? I've got to try to get the extension. And then it only makes it down to here, and then it reverses, and it's coming back up into here. And now you wind up saying, I'm going to take my profit off the table. And then you watch it go down here, and by the end of the day, you've got a big psychological conundrum going on where reality is, if you just said, this is my plan trade, that's what I'm going to look to do. It gets you in, it gets you out. You booked a nice profit, depending on how many shares you're trading at 65 cents per share. That's always one that's worth getting in front of. You can do this with stocks. You can do it with the futures. You can do it with options. There's a bunch of ways to do it. Stock and futures are my favorite way to do this trade. As the day goes on, we're going to make some adjustments to what we're looking at. So based on what happens right after that trade that we had that uh, moved down from the pivot effectively down to 278.97. We see that support and resistance is lining up much more with this 279.30 level. And when we get a retest of this earlier inflection, a little bit later in the session right here at uh, 13.50 or so, then what we see is now we've got an opportunity for a short sale from this 279.30 level if we hit it again. And that's going to be down to right about here, down to about 278.76. Using a resting order, we get that trade once, we get that trade twice, and the final time it blows on through and goes without us. But what happened? We managed to catch the move from 279.31 down to 278.76. That's 55 cents per share traded, and we did it twice. So is this the most exciting way to trade all this intraday stuff? Probably not. It's very methodical and very boring sometimes the way that this plays out, but is it a logical way to develop your bias and stay on the right side of the market? I would say absolutely it is, and that is what's going to keep you on the right side of these trades. You could go long and short. I mean, people are always, you know, well, why wouldn't you go long on this line and short on this line and long on this line? And for me, this is a pretty simple, straightforward answer. I like to stay with the bias on the session. So whatever the stock is telling me it's doing is what I'm going to follow. If this trend would have reversed sharply and wound up back up in here somewhere, then I would have started looking for pullbacks that traded in that direction. But as long as the trend for the day is down the way that it is here, what I'm looking to do with this stock is I'm just finding retracements that are getting to levels of confluence that I've identified. Right, I've got my volume by price bars there. The VWAP on this one hour trend that we had going in here, that gets me down to roughly where my profit objective is. And you can see that the reversal move also left an anchored VWAP that's right there at that 278.76. So the logic is always there. The logic is always working in my favor. And that's what I'm focused on when I'm putting these trades together. So earlier I told you that if you text us, I will send you a video almost every day. And if you text video to this number, so without the quotes, 310 299-9148. What we're going to do is send you every day a text message that has a video embedded in it. It's just a Vimeo link that you can use to see the video when it comes out. That comes out at about 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. That's not an ironclad time. Sometimes it comes out a little bit later. Sometimes it might come out a little bit earlier, but it all depends on what I see going on in the markets. And it's sort of a deep dive into the morning and what I expect to see happening in the afternoon for the triple Qs, because that's the thing that I'm trading over the course of the day. So those discretionary trades come into my trading later in the session. I've got all my automated stuff going off early in the day. It's kind of handling itself over the course of the day. I've got my Baltimore chops that I did. Those are my, my manually placed trades first thing in the morning. Once all that stuff is done, I start figuring out where those inflections are going to be on the triple Qs. And I put together a plan for my guys that says, here's where I'm going to be taking entries. This is where I'm looking for a long side trade. This is where I'm looking for a short side trade. This is what I see happening over the rest of the day. I send that out to everybody and it gives them a roadmap to follow without having to have a, an open mic with me all day long or something like that and allows them to just follow along with what it is that Julie and I are going to be doing as we're trading the triple Qs. 
So that's the first thing that I wanted to tell you about. So go ahead and text to that number, and then you'll also get the option. We'll send you a, a follow-up email just saying, hey, if you'd like to join us in the trading room in the morning, you can do that. We have got room for you for a couple of weeks, and you can see if you like trading those opening gaps. And we can get all of that set up for you for a couple of weeks or even longer if you need a little bit longer. You just let us know. Now, the next thing I want to tell you about is we are going to be in Las Vegas, April 23rd, 2023. That's right before the Traders Expo. We're also going to be speaking at the Traders Expo, but we're doing an event called Super Vol Sunday. And this is going to be all about those discretionary trades that I was telling you about earlier and sort of this thing that you're getting in these videos. This is going to be a deep dive into what it is that I do every single day when I'm picking apart the indices and figuring out where to place trades over the course of the session and how do I go about structuring this stuff. It's going to be six hours in Vegas on Sunday the 23rd. And then it's also going to be recorded and live streamed. So if you can't make it to Vegas, you can do the live stream version of it. It is also going to be accompanied by about six hours to seven hours of packaged coursework that I'm going to put together that includes things like doing simulations and figuring out just how to get yourself in front of those opportunities, managing to get in at the right spots, managing to get out at the right spots, and figuring out how to wrap your psychology around these trades in a way that allows you to practice them before you go and put any kind of money on the line. So it's going to be a great event. We have lots and lots of success with these events that we do. It's going to be seating for about 20 people in Vegas. There are about four seats left at this point, I believe. If you go to TraderInsight.com forward slash super dash ball dash Sunday, it's that URL right there. You can, if you do this in the next few days, still take advantage of an early bird special for the registration. You get discounted pricing. You get the ability to pay over time. And I think you're going to have a really good time in Vegas. If you join us, you're really going to get a good understanding of what it is that we do. And it's a much deeper dive than just listening to 10 or 15 minutes of me discussing how I put these trades on. The guys love it. It's very hands-on. You know, my guys are all very, very involved in everything that we're doing. They trade for a living. They trade each and every day. And they're coming to sharpen their skills on this stuff. And I would love it if you could take the opportunity to at least take a look at what we're going to do and then decide if maybe you want to join us as well. So that's it for me. As I said, we are on a ski trip, so I am not going to be able to take live questions. If you have any questions, you can send me an email at adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N, at traderinsight.com, T-R-A-D-E-R-I-N-S-I-G-H-T.com. Send me an email, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. There should be a recording of this presentation available shortly, so you can review it if you'd like. And I hope, I hope that you got something out of the psychology of the trading and the two strategies that I showed you today. All right, thanks for taking the time to join me.